Hard shot to short. Rizzuto up with a beautifully the throw. In time, Mize got back. Spencer claims that Mize is pulled off the bag. Baseball is truly the all-American sport. Founded in the 1800s by a volunteer firefighter named Alexander Cartwright, baseball finds its origins in the English game of cricket. But the sport has come a long way from those early days when they would actually tag the runners out by throwing the ball at them. You know that had to hurt. Well, today, South Florida has become one of the hot spots for spring training. Several teams call this place home every spring as they prepare for their season. And baseball fans flock from all over the nation to our area to catch these athletes in action. Now, as a kid, I played just about every team sport there was. My dad wasn't just a football coach at Palm Beach Gardens High School. He was my coach. He had me playing sports soon after I was born. And I remember playing Little League Baseball and the pressure when the coach would look my way and shout, Mullins, you're up. Two words that would cause my heart to race. You're up and all eyes are on you. Are you going to get on base? Are you going to strike out? Are you even going to make contact with the ball, Todd? I mean, see, this sport is a little bit different than playing other sports like Little League football, which I also played, because in football, there's at least 10 other guys on the field with you and you're working together as a team. But in baseball, man, it's all on you. All eyes in the stadium are on you when you step up to the plate. Now, all your friends standing in the dugout, man, they're looking at you to see if you're going to hit the ball, if you're going to bring the other players in that are out on the bases. I mean, it's a lot of pressure. But if you never step up to the plate, you never know what's on the inside of you. You never know what you are capable of. Well, there are times in life when God whispers in your ear and he says, you're up. Here's an opportunity that I'm setting before you to talk with this person about life and about Jesus and about hope. And many times we're like that scared kid making his way to the batter box thinking, Lord, not me. I mean, somebody else can do this better than me. I'm, I'm just not ready. I might strike out. Have you ever felt that way? Have you ever said to God, not me, I don't think I'm ready to share my faith yet? Well, we're not ready. And people all around us are dying. I mean, every minute, 160 people die. That's just about 10,000 people dying every hour and 230,000 people dying every day. And those aren't just numbers, are they? And those are people. Those are our neighbors and our coworkers, our family and our friends. And how many of them are going to heaven? And how many are going to hell? That's the problem. So many people are so uncertain. They, they've never dealt with the issue of getting their lives right with God because no one has ever talked to them about it. Well, guess what? You're up. Christ came for one reason, to bring man back into right relationship with God. That was his purpose. That was his mission. See, sin had broken up the relationship between God and man, and Jesus came to put us back together again. And before he ascended to heaven, he told us something that was really important. Jesus said in John chapter 20, verse 21, as the Father has sent me, now I am sending you. The same reason the Father sent me to the earth, to bring man back to God, that's what I'm sending you to do. And in John chapter 17, Jesus is praying to God the Father and he says, in the same way that you, Father, gave me a mission in the world, I give them, my followers, the same mission in the world. See, the same mission that Jesus had to bring man to God is now our mission, it's your mission. The Apostle Paul puts it this way in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. He says, Christ changed us from enemies into his friends and gave us the task of making others his friends also. We have the assignment of helping people come into a friendship with God. How cool is that? Because see, most people think that God is actually mad at them for things that they've done or things that they haven't done. Somebody's got to tell him that he's not mad at them. He's madly in love with them and he wants a relationship with them. Paul goes on to say in that same passage in 2 Corinthians that we are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal to the world through us. We're his ambassadors. Think about an ambassador. That's someone who serves as a representative of a nation or a president or a king. And you and I are called to represent Christ, our king, to the world. You're up. They didn't know the Bible. There wasn't even a Bible for them to read. 
They didn't know all the things that Jesus had taught. They were still learning from the apostles, but they didn't wait until they knew it all to share what they knew. See, what they knew is that Jesus had come into their lives and he had changed everything for them. He had come in and given them a new life. He had taken out their old life and filled them with new hope and a new beginning. So all they had to do was share that. Remember what Jesus had said in Acts chapter one, verse eight. He said, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and to the ends of the earth. You will be my witnesses. I was talking to a young man in our church last week that they didn't know if he was ready to share his faith yet with his friends. He was a new Christian and he was afraid he was gonna mess it up. And I reminded him of that verse. Jesus didn't say, you'll be my salesperson. You better close the deal. He didn't say you have to pressure or argue anyone. He didn't even say that you have to be my attorneys. You don't have to prove anything. That's not your job. He just says, you are to be my witnesses. And a witness just tells others about what they've seen, what they've experienced. Nothing more, nothing less. You don't have to be a Bible scholar to witness for Christ. You don't have to be a Christian for 20 years to witness for Christ. You don't have to have your life all together to be a witness for Christ, because if you did, none of us could do it. As a witness, you just have to tell people, this is what's happened in my life when I met Jesus. He took away my guilt and my past and my shame. He, he gave me this fresh start. He filled my life with purpose and joy. That's all. You know, a little boy was overheard talking to himself as he strutted through the backyard wearing his baseball cap and carrying his ball and bat. He said out loud, I'm the greatest batter in the world. Then he tossed the ball up in the air and he swung his bat and he missed the ball. Strike one, he yelled. Completely unfazed, he picked the ball back up and said again, I'm the greatest batter in the world. He tossed the ball in the air, swung again and missed. Strike two, he shouted. He paused a minute and examined his bat and his ball and he spit in his hands, rubbed them together, straightened his cap out and said once more, I'm the greatest batter in the world. He tossed the ball up in the air, swung at it again, missed, strike three. Wow, he shouted, I'm the greatest pitcher in the world. Just like in the game of baseball, there's gonna be times when you strike out when you're sharing your faith. But don't let that keep you from stepping up to the plate. It was Baseball Hall of Famer Tommy Lasorda that said there are three types of baseball players. Those who make it happen, those who watch it happen, and those who wonder what happened. Let's be the players that make it happen. Let's step up to the plate and let God use our lives to impact the lives of the people around us. In Colossians chapter four, the Apostle Paul gives us a couple insights about how we can be effective in sharing Jesus with the people in our sphere of influence. He says in chapter four, starting around verse two, devote yourselves to prayer, be watchful and thankful, live wisely among those who are not believers and make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversations be gracious and attractive so that you'll have the right response for everyone. This verse breaks down into two parts. First, there's prayer. That's speaking to God about people. And second, evangelism, that's speaking to people about God. And they go hand in hand. We know that it all begins with prayer. You've heard me say many times, God can do more in seconds than men can do in centuries. God can soften the heart of a person that is far from him. God can open up opportunities for you to talk to somebody about Jesus. So Paul says, start with prayer and be devoted to prayer. Don't give up. Just because that friend or family member doesn't turn their life over to Jesus right away, keep praying for them. Be devoted to prayer. Have you ever felt like giving up praying for somebody? Of course you have, I have too. We think, man, that person's just too far gone. I mean, God can't even get through to them. But one lady in our church prayed for her husband to come to Christ for 13 years. He didn't even wanna to come to church with her, much less come to Christ. Then one Sunday morning, he woke up and said, hey, if it's okay, I wanna to go to church with you today. Well, his wife about passed out. After she pulled her jaw off the floor, she got their daughters ready and they headed off to church together as a family and that day, her husband gave his life to Jesus and he's never looked back. Another family in our church prayed for their children for years, loving them through rebellion, drugs and alcohol addictions, in and out of bad relationships. And today, all four kids are serving Jesus. Now, it looked like they were too far gone, but I want you to know that no one is too far gone for Jesus, so be devoted in prayer. Let me ask you this, who are you praying for to come to Christ today? Who is it that's heavy on your heart, that they would turn their life over to Jesus. And if no one comes to mind, who should it be? 
See, a sign of spiritual maturity is that you care about the things that God cares about the most. And God, He loves people more than anything. So begin praying for that person, those people at work or in your family. Be praying for them to find Christ and that God would use you to introduce them to the Lord. Paul tells us to live wisely among those who are not believers. You know, I've heard someone say one time, there are two reasons why people aren't in relationship with Jesus today. One is because they've never met a Christian, and the other reason is because they have met a Christian. And one of the main hindrances to Christ a lot of times are bad Christians. Remember back in school, the game show and tell, you'd bring something in from home and show the class and tell them what it was or what it did? Well, that's what God wants us to be. Show and tell Christians. Our walk needs to match our talk. Now that doesn't mean you have to be perfect, but we can't live like the devil and think our lives are gonna speak for Jesus, right? It says, be wise in the way you act among non-believers. See, your life is being watched. Just like the crowds watch the players on the field, seeing how they play the game, people are watching your life. Your boss at work, your family members, your friends, they're looking to you to see if there's something different. Paul goes on to say in that verse, make the most of every opportunity, which means you've got to seize the moment. When God brings you an opportunity to share Jesus, seize it, you're up. Think about all the opportunities we have. That coworker that's going through a rough time in life and they turn to you for some advice. Or you're on a plane and the person next to you wants to talk and they start talking about all the problems in the world. Man, that's the perfect opportunity for you to share your perspective on God, being in control. Or when your friend asks you, what are you doing this weekend? And you're like, ah, oh, nothing, just hanging out. Nothing, what? You have an opportunity for them to come to church with you and encounter a living God. Seize the opportunity, you're up. And let me just add this. You know, I've heard some people say that I'm just gonna let my life speak for Christ. I don't need to use words. Think about what we're saying when we say that. My life is so much like Jesus, I'm so holy that I don't even need to use words. Really? I mean, even Jesus needed to use words. And on the day of Pentecost, when those 120 people ran into the streets, started telling everybody about Jesus, they used words. If they hadn't used words, 3,000 people wouldn't have gotten saved that day. And in Romans, around chapter 10, Paul says, how will they know unless we tell them? How can they believe in a God of whom they've never heard? Somebody's got to tell them about his love for them. And that somebody is you and me. You're up. Paul ends this passage in Colossians by saying, let your conversations be gracious and attractive so that you will have the right response for everyone. So we have the greatest message of hope and life that's ever been told. It's a message of love and acceptance, not one of judgment or condemnation. See, a lot of people know the verse John 3, 16 that says, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever would believe in him would not perish, but will have everlasting life. And that's a message of life and a message of grace. But the next verse even goes on to say in verse 17, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. That's great news. But somebody has to tell the people in your sphere, in your world, that God loves them and that God is for them. You know, we're just a few weeks away from Easter. And Easter is a time that we celebrate the power of Christ over this world, over death, over the grave and the victory that Jesus brings into each of our lives. You know, we can live in victory in every area of life when we have Christ at the center of our life. And we want everybody to experience this life that Jesus came to bring us. You know, one of the easiest ways for you to take a step this season is to invite people to Easter services. Invite everybody you know, the people at your work, at your school, people you're friends with, even people that you don't know, like your waitress or someone that you randomly strike up a conversation with in the store. It could be that there's nothing random at all about it. It could be that God has sovereignly placed you in their life for just this reason. It's simple, you're up. When I was in high school, my, my grandfather, my dad's dad was, was really sick. He had diabetes and heart disease. He had been through several surgeries. And I remember one day I was visiting him in the hospital right before another surgery. And it was just him and me in the room. And while we were talking, I heard the Lord whisper in my ear and say, Todd, you're up. Tell your grandfather that I love him. Ask him if he's ready to turn his life over to me. 
Well, my grandfather had heard the gospel message many times. I mean, his wife and his kids were followers of Jesus. He'd even heard my dad preach many times, but I knew by his life that he had never fully surrendered to Jesus. And I thought, well, what can I say that he hasn't already heard a hundred times before? What if I don't even know what to say? Once again, I felt the voice of the Holy Spirit just say, you're up. And so I stepped up to the plate and I, I said, Grandpa, I wanna, I wanna talk to you about Jesus and about you turning your life over to him. I don't want you to spend eternity apart from Christ. And I began to unpack God's love for him the best that I knew how as a kid in high school. And right there in that hospital room, I, I led my grandfather in the prayer of repentance. And I'm so glad I listened that day, that I didn't let my excuses excuse me from my mission, because it wasn't long after that day that my grandfather stepped into eternity. See, all around us, we have people that are waiting on us, waiting on someone to, to show them the way, waiting on someone to step up to the plate and help them find their way home. That somebody has to be you, and it has to be me.